You're listening to the Greening Out Podcast. This show contains profanity, hate for the state, and themes of a libertarian nature. If you are easily offended, please listen to something else. For more, visit greeningoutpodcast.co.uk. Hi, I'm Katie Green. Hi, I'm Dan Green. Welcome back to the Greening Out Podcast. Now, Katie and I call ourselves libertarians, but you could say that modern libertarianism can be seen as a form of neoclassical liberalism. So we wanted to devote a show to talking about classical liberalism. Uh, And joining us to do this is Sean Gabb, who's director of the Libertarian Alliance. Uh, Sean, thanks so much for coming back on the show. I'm always delighted to be called on, and I'm very happy to be here tonight. I'm very pleased to have you. So... Sean, we know that we have the Whigs, the Radicals, and the p Light Tories forming the Liberal, the Liberal Party round about the 1850s, but these liberal ideas actually go back further. So where do we see the beginning of liberal thought, do you think? Yes. Um, we all, many of us like to start it with the Greeks because, let's face it, almost everything started with the Greeks. Mm. And y- you will find something very similar to modern classical liberalism it, it, among the followers of the philosopher Epicurus. Um, I did write um, a long essay on Epicurus some years ago in which I tried to establish that he was the first great libertarian. I am However, a fan. I am a fan. Mm, yes, yeah. indeed, a great man. <laughs> However, uh, I, I really think that the liberal tradition as we know it doesn't go back much further than the high middle ages uh, about the 12th 13th centuries although we can find precursors among the greeks and doubtless we could look among other civilizations it it is difficult to see the present liberal tradition the, the liberal tradition that we enjoy as going back uh, much beyond the High Middle Ages. And this seems to be a very West European thing. Um, let, let me give you some examples. And you, um, you can tell a lot about a people from their fairy stories or just their stories. Yeah. Now, I, I, once had, I once had a class of students from all over the world. And I asked them, do you have any stories in your culture about people who sell their soul to the devil? <laughs> and the non-Europeans shook their heads. They'd never heard of such a thing. Sell your soul to the devil. And the East Europeans were aware of it, but they were aware of it from German, from translations of German fairy stories. It is not mm-hmm. something which is native to their culture. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, so far as I can tell, stories of selling your soul to the devil go back to about the 12th century in Western Europe, mostly England and Germany, Northern Europe. Mm -hmm. And what can you tell about such stories? Well, the most obvious thing you can tell about them is that each individual has a soul which belongs to him. Ah, It may belong to Uh Yes, it may belong to God in the general sense, but each individual has, at the very least, uh, total custody over his soul while he possesses it. Uh, And so you are able to sell it. I never, yeah, I never actually put that together, sort of implies that it is yours to sell. Yes. I'd, I'd never really thought of it that way. It implies that it's yours to sell that you can sell it in some in some by some formal means of transfer and that uh, once the contract has been made it must be mm-hmm. observed mm-hmm. Uh, and so in that rather strange fairy story in that tradition of fairy stories you, you have the essence i think of the liberal tradition now, there's a, a rather nastier, um, well, I suppose selling your soul is as nasty as you can get, well, but there's a, yeah. there is a rather nasty um, English and German fairy story. It, it, it is an English fairy story more than anything mm-hmm. else. Um, it's a cold winter, food is short, and you have a family, and the man of the house decides that 
it's time to make unpleasant choices. Naturally. And so what he does is he tells his aged father, who, who has been living in the family since he became old and infirm, I'm sorry, Daddy, it's, you've got to go out into the cold and oh, free. Gosh. And he turns to his son and says, give your grandfather a blanket, would you? We must observe the niceties. <laughs> and the son takes a knife and cuts the blanket in half and gives half to his grandfather. <clears throat> his father is angry, saying, oh, this is monstrous, you can't do that to your grandfather. And the son says, uh, well, you know, I need the other half for when it's your turn, don't I? <laughs> Natural now, selection. <laughs> yes, indeed. Now, oh dear. what that story tells you is something about the social structure of mm. England. Um, again, if you tell that story to um, an East European or a Central European or certainly a non-European class, they will be astonished. Um, not outraged, just astonished. Mm. Because in their cultures, authority lies with the head of the family. The elder, who, the eldest male. Uh, whereas what this story tells you is that uh, you're living in a country where the nuclear family is the norm. And if an aged relative lives with you, he is living with you as a guest. You've invited him in, and if necessary, you can um, turn him out again. So... We're going back into the High Middle Ages, and if you look at the kind of stories, the kind of popular fairy stories coming out of that culture, what you see is something which presupposes what we would recognize as classical liberalism, the idea of individual autonomy, and indeed of individual autonomy uh, within a nuclear family structure. And it is not surprising, I think, that in countries like England, um, in some of the Western German states, in Scotland, of course, and in um, France as well, that y y you have a strong assertion of popular rights against the claims of the crown. The, the king might lean on the priests, or the king and the priests might come together and announce that... Uh, the king is by God anointed, and damned are those that that dare resist or touch the Lord's anointed. Mm. Um, but you have to shout that very, very loud to make people listen to it, and it doesn't make it doesn't make any difference at all when the representative assembly of the people decide that they will not accept this latest request for um, a, a customs and excise or, or, a, or a loan or some other kind of tax. So what I'm saying is that, cl is that classical liberalism is not something that just sprang into existence mm -hmm. in the middle of the 17th century, and it's certainly not something which emerged with the rediscovery of classical antiquity. This is something that is hardwired into the culture of the West European peoples, mm -hmm. and I suppose you could say specifically of the English people. And you can see um, many strong elements of what we regard as liberalism throughout, throughout medieval and early modern history. Mm -hmm. And so what happened in the 1640s, in England especially, should not be seen as a fundamental break with the past, but as the very strong and largely successful assertion of um, a, a number of propositions which had always been implicitly accepted within this country of individual rights and indeed of individual rights which could be asserted and enforced against the highest authorities in the state. Mm -hmm. So, Sean... What you're saying is basically it's it's like a natural inherent thing, so it's not like some kind of thought that was, you know, just developed. Um, it's that thought's been kind of in the background of culture and like sort of this part of Europe for a long, long time. Oh, yes. It's um, like with marriage customs. 
it is very difficult to think um, of a situation in which some inspired thinker sits up and says, let me tell you about individual rights. And everyone sits around saying, gosh, I never thought of that before. <laughs> Let's have a liberal revolution, shall we? Oh, yeah. N no, what you find is that the notable liberal philosophers of, of the 17th century were working within a body of implicit assumptions. They were already accepted. Yeah, and who are some of these philosophers, Sean, that we should be talking about then? My friend Robert Henderson has a great regard for the I English uh, radical philosophers of the 1640s and 50s, people like John Lilburn, um, I suppose William Walvin as well. But my, my own detailed and my own detailed reading of, of the 17th century liberals really starts with John Locke and uh, I suppose it's not grossly controversial to say that John Locke is the liberal philosopher of the 17th century and one of the greatest of the liberal philosophers uh, the core text we're talking about is his second letter on sorry second treatise on civil government mm -hmm. written i think around 1681 but not published until 1689 um he starts it by discussing discussing human beings in a state of nature <clears throat> In a state of nature, we have complete freedom over our own minds and bodies. We can dispose of ourselves as we please, and we will make agreements with the people around us for the peaceful resolution of disputes mm -hmm. and for the mutual protection of our property. Mm -hmm. And when those agreements become more general, uh, when they come to embrace an entire society, we can talk about a social contract that that is an agreement which governs all relationships between the rulers and the ruled and although the rulers being the rulers deserve um deserve obedience that that duty of obedience only extends so far as how well the rulers are keeping their side of the contract. If the rulers of a country break the social contract, if they, uh, if they start trespassing on the legitimate rights of the people, then it is the right, it is the duty of the people to tear down that government and establish one which will be, um, which will, sorry, which will keep its side of the bargain more effectively. We can ask, well, you know, can you show me a, can you show me a state of nature? And also, mm -hmm. can you show me a social contract? Where's it written down? Yeah, but exactly. uh, that's not asking the right question, I think. Um, John Locke is not saying what can be proven to have happened. He is, he is setting out a, a semi his sorry, he's setting out what's called a conjectural historical theory of how government must in the past have emerged. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps governments did not emerge through any kind of contract. They seem usually to emerge through a process of conquest and, uh, and fraud. Yeah. But, <laughs> it's funny that, isn't it? Yes, I know. Mm -hmm. But once you leave aside that minor wrinkle in the theory, it is a good theory. What it says is that however government emerged, it should be regarded as sitting on a basis of contract, and the most obvious contractual basis is that we pay our taxes, we bow down, we bow the knee, we touch our forelocks, and in return these people protect our life, liberty, and property, and except for the purpose of protecting it, they leave us alone in the enjoyment of our life, liberty, and property. Uh, and although a number of um, less radical theorists in the 18th century, notably, I suppose, David Hume, the great Scottish philosopher, was rather 
scathing about John Locke in places, the, their own replacement um, theories of government and popular rights are not fundamentally different in, in their effects. The idea is still that government exists to protect life and property and if a government stops protecting life and property if it grossly violates life and property then it is no longer a legitimate government mm -hmm. yeah and um, Katie mm -hmm. at the start um, of the show uh, mentioned sort of and you alluded to the, the radicals mm -hmm. um, Katie mentioned how it was the Radicals, the Whigs, and the Peelite Tories that got together to turn the, the these liberal did, ideas yeah. into the Liberal Party yeah. and a political force. Um, Sean, can you tell us something about how that happened? Very well. We do regard Victorian England, oh, sorry, since we're, uh, we do regard Victorian Britain <laughs> as the uh, as the promised land of classical liberalism. It, it is the great classical age, ju just as a classicist will look to 5th century Athens or 1st century Rome uh, as, one of the age, as one of the ages of greatness, so we as libertarians look to Victorian Britain as an age of liberal greatness when it was the hegemonic ideology. I, I think, however, if you look in any detail at what happened in the 19th century, you will shake your head w with astonishment. You, you will say, how on earth could these people have been doing this? How on earth could they have expected consequences other than the ones with which we're now living? Um, if you look at the English state at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, and since this was a very decentralized United Kingdom, I, I think I will concentrate on England because um, although the Scottish state was equally disordered in many respects, it was different. Yeah. If we look at the English state at the beginning of the 19th century, what you see is chaos. You see, you, you see the most profligate waste of resources. You, you see a system of criminal and civil law which does not work very efficiently. You, you see an unreformed parliament. Uh, you, you see an established church wi within which no more than about 60% of the people um, Within, sorry, embracing not more than 60% of the people. You have um, a large Catholic minority and a large and growing dissenter minority who have no place within the established church and state of England. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it is easy to make the case for reform. The problem is that when the Whigs started their um, process of reform in the 1830s, they disturbed a constitutional settlement which, however defective it may have been in its incidentals, had lasted since the end of the 17th century and which had been very successful at restraining the state, at keeping it so far as possible to protecting life and property, oh, and of course defending the country against external threats. Mm -hmm. What the Whigs in the 1830s did, oh, let me give you some actual examples. The Municipal, Corpor the Municipal Corporations Act, 1834, I think, which set up um, elected town councils and uh, the, later on the, um, the public health legislation, uh, and then later on the rather small and initially modest um, structure for subsidizing um, education for the poor. All of these reforms involved the creation of bureaucracies, small bureaucracies, very efficient bureaucracies, uh, bureaucracies which, looking only at their positive achievements, were most impressive. But of course, the moment you set up a bureaucracy, the people employed within it will begin to agitate for more functions. 
and once they have more functions, they'll need more um, they'll need more functionaries. And then once they have more functionaries, they'll look around for more functions, and so it goes on. Mm. And um, the early Victorian liberals started a process of public choice transformation of the country, and we are living with its consequences now. We then have the weakness of the liberal ideology in the, um, during the 19th century. The, the idea of restraining the state continued well past the midpoint in the century. It continued into the 1870s, indeed into the 1880s and beyond in some places. But um, it, it wasn't a very radical, it wasn't a very well thought through um, theory of state restraint. It already accepted the idea that government had a positive role not simply a negative role in the sense of protecting life and property, but a positive role in the sense of advancing the um, the health and the general well-being of the people. And once you allow that, then you, you start to find slippage. You, you're slipping. 1850. 1857, I think it was, the, the first of the Obscene Publications Acts. Before, before that act came into, into effect, it was virtually impossible to, um, to stop, to censor pornography. Uh, you, you could prosecute people for obscene libel or, or for blasphemy, but it was very difficult to get convictions. And all manner of smutty books and prints were openly on sale in this country. And this was considered to be bad for the health and well-being of the people. And since government had a positive role to play in um, bringing these about, let's have an act which will, which will prohibit the, the worst cases of obscenity. Yeah. Uh, which meant, since that act was not reformed until, 18, until 1959, which meant... Um, the virtual shutting down of any discussion of sex, um, erotica, or anything else. Uh, y you have um, all manner of expansions in the early public health legislation. You have the state, you have the state, the beginnings of state education, uh, and so on and so forth, always for the best of intentions, I, I don't deny, and always at their outset rather modest initiatives. But as I said, you, you can draw a line on a diagram um, connecting then to now, and it's difficult to show a breach of more than a few years at a time in the trend of that curve. Mm -hmm. So that's what went wrong with liberalism. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, do you mean like they the Liberal it, Party, so. basically, um, because of their, their policies, they actually made a complete mess of it? <laughs> yes, I do. Indeed, you'll find... Sabotage. <laughs> Yes, you'll find that um, you, you, the negative conception of government, indeed uh, general suspicion of government, survived more vigorously in the Conservative Party than among the Liberals. Mm -hmm. It was Conservatives who resisted uh, the, the creation of these bureaucracies, and, and then who resisted the expansion of their functions. Uh, looking at the moral legislation, it was um, a liberal politician, who now I can't forget, who introduced the Obscene Publications Bill in 1857. It was um, a, a liberal government which, uh, brought in the first, which brought in the first significant licensing act to control the drinks trade in the 1870s. Mm -hmm. It was a Liberal government which brought in the Licensing Act in 1908, which um, was a very restrictive um, set of controls on the drinks trade. 
It was the Liberals, especially in the 1900s, the, um, the Campbell, Bannerman and Asquith governments, which uh, brought in a mass of moralistic and economic regulation. Um, well, I've mentioned the uh, I've mentioned the Licensing Act, but you've also got a great deal of eugenic legislation, the Mental Deficiency Act, um, which I think passed in nineteen. 19- oh, the Mental Deficiency Act. I'm not, I'm not very f- familiar with that. Oh, forgive me. Um, I can certainly look it up. It's not a problem. It's just. Oh, a- I can explain it very briefly. There is. Um, There is a great deal of scientific argument that most of our qualities, intellectual, moral, as well as physical, Mm -hmm. are hereditary. Mm -hmm. And once you accept this, it may also be accepted that it becomes the right and duty of the state to ensure that... um, that the fitter members of society have more children than the less fit, that the less fit are deterred and that the fitter are encouraged. I see. And yep. you may pass on from that to the further claim that the unfit, the seriously unfit, should either be confined in special asylums or that uh, there should be a strict supervision over their life outside an asylum. And the Mental Deficiency Act brought in by the Asquith government um, established quite a lot of this into British law. It became a criminal offence, for example, to have sex with um, a mentally unfit woman. Um, It became... It was made legal to incarcerate people who were seriously deficient, but um, not necessarily a danger to anybody else. Mm-hmm. It, it, now, this was a this was a bill which was almost hysterically opposed in Parliament mm-hmm. by the. Uh, it was hysterically opposed by the Catholic Church, as you can well imagine, mm-hmm. but also by yeah. the Conservative leadership. They said that this was. Um, a dreadful breach in our civil liberties, mm-hmm. which of course it was. Uh, the, the scientific claim about the heritability of certain qualities mm-hmm. is entirely separate from any arguments over whether the state should intervene in these matters. You, you don't have to, you don't have to um, disbelieve in eugenics to, to denounce the Mental Deficiency Act. I suppose it helps, though. No, yeah. And yes, and so the liberals were not particularly liberal, and they became less and less liberal the closer we get to the Great War. And it is always the conservatives dragging their feet, saying, "No, you can't do this." Oh, here's an example: Punishment of Incest Act, 1908. Difficult to argue that there was um, an epidemic of incestuous relationships in Edwardian England, Uh, but uh, the government decided to criminalise it again because of um, a set of scientific arguments uh, claiming that um, when close relations when when close relations breed the offspring are deficient, or at least have a greater tendency towards deficiency. And so you, and so you criminalize it. Mm-hmm. Now, what you're doing is you're criminalizing uh, sexual relationships between adults. The Conservatives resisted this. Um, in, in, I think it was Lord Lawburn, a former Conservative Lord Chancellor, who said in Lords, mm-hmm. we don't need this, we don't need this law, uh, because the Indecency with Children Act already protects young people. Yeah. That, that covers, covers it. That one. <laughs> this is simply making, it's simply creating crimes for consenting adults. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it's one thing, I mean, per- personally, the idea of, like, doing that with someone I'm related to is gross just, like, to me, but mm. it doesn't mean that I care what other people do. Like, I don't really no, care. That, <laughs> no, there Whatever is a they want to do. Yeah, there is a very strong... A very strong 
taboo in our mm. society, in our civilization indeed, against incest or mm. uh, sexual relationships between very close relatives. Um, Why do you think, Sean, that the government's so interested in people's sex lives? Because it seems that way to me. They're very interested in in what you're doing. They want to they want to regulate that age of consent and all these kinds. Yeah, of things. like they want to they want to be involved in every every process. Well, once with the once you've established the principle that the government is a that the government should promote the health and well being of the nation. All you need to do is to prove that any particular measure will promote the health and well-being of the nation. Um, if you are going to, if the state is going to build waterworks, if the state is going to um, is going to treat sewage, well, why shouldn't it stamp out venereal disease by licensing prostitutes, or why shouldn't it promote a more manly? Uh, race by um, b- by criminalizing um, indecency between men, and why should it not deter the procreation of the mentally and physically and morally unfit by criminalizing incest and by criminalizing sexual relationships with people who are themselves defined as unfit? W- once you once you allow the principle that the state can and should intervene to um, secure the health of the nation. It is very difficult to draw a line. All you can do is keep insisting that whatever the general principle, it doesn't apply in this case. And the Conservatives did that with conspicuous success for much of the later 19th century. But it was, um, although a conspicuous success, it was a diminishing success. Mm-hmm. And so, you're saying that, like, obviously, so if we're into, like, the sort of 1900s, we're moving into the 20th century, would you say that at that point, the sort of Liberal Party, that's when they would move more to what we would maybe call social liberalism? Like, I mean, with the setting up of, like, the welfare state, things like this? Yes. Okay, there, there's a... There's a there's quite a substantial liberal or libertarian rather bibli- historiography of the National Insurance Act 1911. Mm. Um, I don't claim to be an expert in this. All I will say is that, uh, pardon me, <clears throat> all I will say is that there was a dense network of friendly societies, entirely voluntary organizations in England and probably in Scotland too which meant that large and increasing numbers of working-class families by the turn of the 20th century were covered by various kinds of insurance scheme against sickness, Ill, uh, sickness, injury, and old age. Mm-hmm. And the problem with this, from the point of view of middle-class professionals, was that you have ordinary working people getting together, establishing a pot of money and appointing treasurers and other officers, Mm. and then negotiating with doctors and lawyers and accountants and saying, no, we want it this way. No, we don't want that. We want this. Can't you do this? Well, if you can't do this, we'll get someone else who can do it. Mm. And uh, this is very demeaning. You You are a gentleman. You expect that you should be earning at least five hundred pounds a year, and that um, that that you'll be treated with a certain respect by your social inferiors. And here you've got these committees all over the place um, telling you what they want and what they don't want, and how much they're willing to pay for it. And so it was most reassuring when the government stepped in and said, "Well, we will." We will bring in a system of compulsory insurance for every working man and woman in this country, and the state will employ and pay the doctors and the lawyers and the other professional persons. We shall act as guardians of the people in this respect. 
Uh, and since it is the middle class professionals who are the government to a very large extent, um, you can imagine what happened. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I must say that the more I look at late Victorian liberalism, the less I like it. <laughs> now, um, socialism. Yes. Many people would say that the last liberal government was tending towards socialism. I, I don't think that is the case. Indeed, it's even it's actually rather difficult to say that the first Labour MPs in the House of Commons uh, election in 1906 were socialists in the 1930s, 40s and 50s sense. Um, socialism is all about state control and indeed state ownership of the commanding heights of the economy. And you'll find that um, liberal and labor politicians were not that interested in, uh, in the kind of socialism that I can well remember and that you may just about remember, uh, the idea of a cradle-to-grave welfare state. Mm -hmm. Um, well, certainly not the idea of nationalization of the shipbuilding industry or the steel industry or the railways or what have you. The liberals, the more totalitarian liberals in this country towards the end of the 19th century and well into the 20th century, were not interested that much in economic socialism. They were much more interested in moral reform that they were much more interested, for example, in shutting down the pubs than in regulating the steel industry. Mm -hmm. And you may regard the middle and later decades of the 20th century as an aberration from a trend. Uh, the Oh, the kind of Labour politicians you get in Scotland who believe that corner shops should be owned by the state. <laughs> that is it, that is an aberration. We used to have that in England. Uh, you know, the, the Michael Foots, the oh, yeah. um, the Douglas Jays, and so on, who believed that state planning of the economy was both more efficient and oh, yeah. more moral than the sure. anarchy of the market. Sure. The the people we need to fear in this country, certainly in England and probably in Scotland as well are the people who believe that the price of bread should be left to the market and that uh, Marx and Spencer should not be told how long and what colour overcoat should be, okay. but who are absolutely determined to stamp out smoking and yeah. to moderate people's drinking and to ban the production and sale of um, deep-fried Mars bars in batter. Ah, yes. I had one today. No, I'm just kidding. Yes. I, I, they are absolutely just disgusting. I had one once. Yeah. As far as, uh, as far as the, uh, as far as the Puritan, uh, sorry, as far as the Puritan strain in British politics goes, we're living through a golden age. These people do not want to have to fuss on about the losses of the telephone network. They don't want to get involved in um, the, they don't want to get involved in investment decisions in um, railway building and um, ship building, not that we have much of either nowadays. They would much rather, they'd much rather spend their lives telling us how many boiled potatoes we should eat. <laughs> there is a lot of that though, I mean, I, I, as I've said before, I work in pharmacy. The amount that's spent in, on the NHS on lit, on lit, literature and pamphlets that come through the door about like how to be healthier and things and how to get free vitamins and on the NHS and things like this it's really there's a huge th culture of that and oh it just that sickens me it just uh, it really really annoys me. Oh, this is what they've always wanted. And you can trace it back to the middle of the 19th century 
and supposedly enlightened liberal politicians. Uh, bring people like Edwin Chadwick forward and show him the National Health Service, this vast bureaucracy mm. and its frequently mad decisions, and he might scratch his head. But uh, he, is one of the, he is one of the founding grandfathers of the system we now have. He's one of the people who established the principle <coughs> that the state is there to promote the health and well-being of the people. Mm. And the NHS is an attempt at doing just that. Do you know, I so, thought about this. Sorry, Dan, can I just say something? I, I thought about this the other day, and there's a heck of a lot of harm reduction um, involved in the NHS, especially here in Scotland. And yeah. I've thought about this a lot, and the whole idea about the harm reduction excuse is to say, well, it saves the future generations of the NHS. But this mm. is... This is on, it's all on the basis of we're going to have this socialist healthcare in 50 years or 100 years as if it's the only way to do things, as if it's, that's the way it is, that's the as way it will it always be. Collapse. Yeah. I, I saw an interesting ad, Sean, uh, the other day in the Metro. I've spoken about the Metro. Uh, as I don't really like it. It's a free paper I get on the bus. Um, but there was a large advert from the BMA. And uh, it was basically saying, leave our NHS out of it, like telling, basically telling all political parties to leave the NHS out of things. Oh, yes. As if yes. it's not a bargaining tool kind of thing, mm. you know. Mm. But it immediately made, made me think, so they're trying to make it just establishing that this is the way it will always be in the UK. There's never going to be another another way for health care. No, it's just, well, I, an just an observation I thought I'd throw in. Yes, it's a good one. I, I sometimes argue with doctors, sometimes on the radio, <laughs> sometimes just face to face. <laughs> and I like to be blunt with them. I say, your duty as a doctor, especially as an NHS doctor, is to cure us of our ailments as and when we present ourselves in your office. <laughs> and that is the whole extent of your duty. Um, Whatever we might do before we get in your office or indeed after we leave your office is none of your business. Yeah. And they do not disagree. If you'd argued with um, an old Labour socialist about the, the best way of um, the, the best way of running the railway network or whether the telephone should be private or public, you'd get an argument. What you get from doctors is shocked outrage. Oh, yeah. The the idea that these people are to be regarded on exactly the same basis as plumbers and um, computer repairmen, mm. that you take something to them and say, look, I've got a problem, fix it, and then you just send them away again. That is not, that, that's not how they conceive themselves. They, they are not technicians. They, they're not there to patch us up. Mm. They are there to guide us. Mm towards a healthier way of life, physically and morally. I, and I find that the NHS is a perfect excuse for that because they're basically saying, well, you're costing the NHS money by, say, being morbidly obese. So and, you're and costing the NHS money. that gets people all money. angry. Going... So then they say, well, fat people should be told to not be fat. I don't know. Something, yes, but, something like that. And they, they, that, that's how they involve themselves. The NHS is a great excuse to do that, really. It is. But we mustn't, um, we mustn't forget that the American system, though institutionally different, is often just as paternalistic. It's flawed, I mm -hmm. think. Yes, yes. absolutely. Oh, Sean, now you were, you're kind of saying that what we have now, uh, we can go back to the 19th century and see that this was being set up. Do you think that, for example, do you think why a lot of these things were put in, a lot of these um, things you mentioned earlier on, was it because of an influence of utilitarianism on liberal thinking? Or do you think it was for purposes of control? Um, oh, there's an active debate about this on the LA blog. It's been rumbling on for years and will carry on <laughs> until all the various participants are dead. Um... I am a bit of a utilitarian, so I'm not going to say it's all the fault of Jeremy Bentham. Mm -hmm. um, Bentham himself was a notably tolerant man, and um, although John Stuart Mill 
he used to be blamed in many respects. No, I, I don't think it's utilitarianism. It is possible to say that there is a Puritan strain in our national life. It's stronger in Scotland than in England, but it's powerful in England as well. Uh, there is a powerful tendency towards Puritan control. The, the idea that there is an elite and because it is because it is uniquely good and or uniquely healthy or whatever it, it has the right to guide the rest of society t towards the good life now now this uh, was manifested in the 17th century um in religion in the 19th century it was manifested in various schemes of social reform and this continued into the 20th century. I indeed, you can connect modern political correctness to uh, the Puritan progressives of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Th the idea is still that um, these people are better than we are, and because they are our betters, they have the right and duty to guide us towards a better conception of life than we are able to form by ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and socialism hardly comes into this. Mm -hmm. And, well, do you think then, was there, a, was there a way the Liberal Party of like the 19th century could have, act, could have like, acted differently or was this just bound to happen because of, you know, I'm... Um, something of an anarchist so is it because is this something that's bound to happen because we had a government in the first place uh i'm not actually an anarchist i mean i'm not willing to argue with anarchists i'm willing to consider the possibility that one day we shall proceed to a stateless society so um i, I wouldn't necessarily say that government is inevitably the root of all this um the question you asked was, is, is there anything the Liberals could have done? Yes, indeed there is something the Liberals did. In 1886, they split over the issue of Irish Home Rule. Now, whatever you think, whatever you think of Irish Home Rule, um, it was a very good thing for British freedom that the Liberal Party split in 1886 and was not able to form a stable majority government or, or for another 20 years mm. oh there was you know, there was a little liberal government of lord rosebery but it couldn't do very much um what you had was something like 20 years of uninterrupted conservative government and although the conservatives did various uh, progressive things they they were dragged unwillingly towards it and there was always substantial opposition from the conservative back benches and so conservative governments were, everyone will, agree, everyone will agree that conservative governments in the late 19th century were less progressive than their liberal rivals. Uh, but since the liberal rivals were progressing towards a kind of moral totalitarianism, the split in the Liberal Party was um, a, a very useful thing. Mm -hmm. And if the liberals, if we'd wanted, um, if we'd wanted these moral totalitarians never to, um, never to get their hands back on the leaves of power, we can perhaps denounce Joseph Chamberlain for splitting the Conservative Party over the issue of uh, tariff reform in the early 1900s. He let them back in. Ah, oh, right. I see. Yeah. That's, that's that's quite interesting um, because. In some ways, you're saying that, um, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you're kind of saying that in some ways the Conservative Party of the day were sort of more what we might now call libertarian than the classical liberals were. Seems to be that way, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> Indeed, you could argue that um, the old landed interest, the aristocrats, were the most objectively libertarian politicians in 19th century Britain insofar as they resisted virtually every single reform that conservative or liberal governments brought forward. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the reforms were good. The Judicature Act, for example, it's hard to argue with the principle 
of the Judicature Act, a single High Court of Justice instead of all of these different ragbag courts, the Court of King, Court of Queen's Bench, Court of Chancery, Court of Admiralty, Court of the Exchequer Court, and so on. Mm. Um, but uh, the problem is that you can't pick and choose the overall trend of the reforming legislation of the 19th century was away from freedom, e even though in some cases um, the reforming legislation may have made things better. Mm. And um, so would you say, I said in the introduction, that um, you could say that modern libertarianism could be described as a form of classical, uh, of, it could be formed because you termed as a form of neoclassical liberalism. Uh, do you think that's right or would you disagree with that statement? Of course I wouldn't disagree with it. Yes, there is an obvious intellectual... Uh, there's an obvious connection yeah. between the great liberal philosophers and the modern libertarians. Mm. Um, we are rather sniffy about some of the mid, at mid and late 19th century liberal philosophers. Uh, John Morley, for example, John Stuart Mill, though they were great liberals and they believed in uh, religious and intellectual toleration. Um, but w what I think I would like to do is come back to the first point I made, mm. which is that whatever you want to call libertarianism, mm. it does seem to be hardwired into the, into the cultural assumptions of the people of northwestern Europe. Mm. This has been the case for nearly a thousand years, and although we are going through a long eclipse at the moment, we can feel um, a certain optimism. We, we can feel some confidence that something so deeply rooted cannot so easily be pulled out. Mm -hmm. For a thousand years, our history has been a set of struggles for individual rights. Mm -hmm. Sometimes individual rights lose out, sometimes they come roaring back, but the argument is always over the rights of the people. Uh, this is not something I suspect that you see very often in Indian and Chinese history. And Indian and Chinese libertarians, and there are such, I know some, mm. they are, at the moment, rather exotic, alien creatures in their own countries. <laughs> I, I, wish, I wish them the very best of luck. And um, bear in mind that although these are deep-seated assumptions, mm. they can be spread by example. Mm. But going back to Northwestern Europe, there is this overarching history of liberty and I don't think that we've reached the end of it yet mm -hmm. yeah I think that's a good point to start wrapping up actually it's an interesting <laughs> one and it's making me think of a lot of other things that we could actually talk about <laughs> I know we're going to be wrapping up now yeah. it's just making me think that things like social media um, are really uh, adding to this idea of a collective as opposed to the sort of the individual. Mm. There's almost a sense of you have to be involved, mm -hmm. and you have to be in every aspect. This whole thing, you know, you have your your whole life and your phone kind of thing, and you're never really alone. Yeah, it's not about the individual; it's more about the collective, the collective and things like mind, that. If you want to say that, and I'm seeing that a lot with these, you know, viral things like take mm. part in these viral videos, you know, do this thing where people pour water over your head and everybody gets involved and you feel like you're part of something. But yeah, it's, it's all becoming just, like one sort of digital but hive it's mind. It's a big distraction and it's not it's not really good and I think that, that that's taking away from something that's incredibly important. Um as you said, the needs of the individual, I don't think it's thought about enough. No. Oh, I sound so selfish. Oh, <laughs> awful. I agree with you. But yeah, oh. I think that's where we'll start to wrap up. Um, Sean, this has been great and very thank interesting. Thank you very, very much. It's been very, very interesting. Oh, thank you. I, I always enjoy our um, our conversations.
I know. We never quite know where they're going to go. It's always <laughs> no. interesting, the NHS, you know, sex, all this stuff. So it, it, all, it, it all comes up. Well, I was mending a laser printer when you mended, and I'll have to carry on. Uh, I'll have to carry on mending the thing. But it's been an enjoyable break from that. Good luck with that. Oh, fantastic! Well, um, Sean, is there anything you want to tell us about? Anything you want to plug at the moment? Are you working? Oh, where on people can get you online through the Libertarian Alliance or anything? Um, oh yes, I do. Um, the Liberal, sorry, the Libertarian Alliance has now been recognised by Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs as a charity for tax purposes. <laughs> it's it's taken six months of oh, correspondence, right. and the authorities looked at us quite closely, and eventually they decided that we are a good cause. You're real people. You're We're real people, good. and so uh, you have been speaking to the director of a charity this evening. Ooh, <laughs> I'm going to put that in the blurb. That's the first time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, and great. also, you've been doing Libertarian Question Time as well. Oh, yes. Um, that's Keir Martland's mm. baby. And <laughs> it's a very, very pretty baby, isn't it? It's <laughs> so well. We like it's it. something... That's one on mon Mondays, isn't it? Every second it is. Monday. Every Monday. second Monday. Now, um, we've been talking about podcasting for years. We have the technology. We know how to use the technology. And we've been saying, yes, what we need to do is this. We need to do this. We need to do this. But um, we've never done any of it. And then a few months ago, Story of Keir, my life, Sean. Yes, <laughs> Keir said, I want to do this. And he did it. And he's doing it extremely well. So you know, um, He's doing really well. We had him on. He's doing fan mm. fantastic for such a young yeah. man. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. So much, Sean, for coming on the show. Um, for more libertarian podcast ratings and news, please go to greetingitpodcast.co.uk Yes, um, thank you for listening. Sean, thanks for coming on the show. Looking forward to the next one. Bye.